Thanks so much. And um, yeah, thank you so much for having me tonight um, and for letting me speak first. Sorry, it's a hectic week, so I will have to go after this, but um, it's great to be here and I'm really happy to share a few thoughts um, about the work that we're doing at Positive Money. Um, so just for a bit of context, we were set up after the 2008 financial crash to reimagine what a fair, democratic and sustainable money and banking system would look like and to bring more people into decision making about the financial rules that that govern us all um, so I'm not at all an agriculture expert I'll leave that to the to the real experts um, later on but I'm going to just set the scene for the kind of financing challenge of the transition and I wanted to start with a quote that I found really useful uh, from the economist Anne Pettifor who's written a lot about how we finance a global green new deal which is take an asset that's finite whether grain property or energy when a when a wall of money is aimed at that asset, it inflates the price. I feel like this is a really good starting point for the state of our financial system, which is set up to encourage speculation on assets, to pump money into housing and financial markets, and speculation on the prices of food and energy. So as we've seen really clearly over the last couple of weeks, especially with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, um, it's a very unstable system. It's undemocratic. People don't get a say mostly in how these decisions are made. It concentrates wealth in financial centers and it also deprives businesses and communities of the resources they need to transition. So what we try and think about a positive money is this big macro challenge of how do we make public and private money flow to the things that we really need how do we also keep the economy stable in the process? And importantly, how do we distribute the, the costs and benefits fairly and give communities more control over their resources? So those are huge questions. I'm just gonna offer five thoughts on how we do that from our perspective, which is a focus on the money and banking system. So first, we think we need much higher levels of public investment. So the Climate Change Committee recommends that to reach net zero, we need to upscale low carbon investment from 10 billion pounds a year in 2020 to over 50 billion a year by 2030. And we know that there are lots of parts of the economy where public investment is more efficient than private investment, contrary to what we're often told, and it's and which is really necessary to deliver the transition fairly. But we know we can't have all of this decided through central government about where money goes. So we need also local authorities to be properly financed and we need communities to have a say in how money is spent, which is why we've recently been experimenting with a citizen panel on the cost of living crisis in Cheshire. And we think we need to see many more of these in the future. Second, as well as public investment, we also need to shift private investment to the right places too and to have accountability about how we do that. So we've seen that the Bank of England, our central bank, can step in in crises to support business, to offer low, low cost financing, low cost um, business support schemes. And we really need them to step up and exercise these powers to direct finance into low carbon sectors as well. And we know that that has a sign that not only direct the amount of money involved in the actual scheme itself, but it also has a signaling effect that these are valuable and safe investments to make. So we need to be holding the Bank of England accountable on this as well. Thirdly, we need to protect the public against banks risk-taking activities. So this is so clear at the moment, but we know that banks are pouring money into fossil fuels and ecologically destructive activities. And to give a couple of stats on that, the five biggest British banks have poured over £275 billion into fossil fuels since the signing of the Paris Agreement. And HSBC, the UK bank HSBC, made $6 billion worth of deals in five years between 2016 and 2021, with some of the world's most destructive agribusinesses as well. So this is a really important way in which policy in the UK and finance in the UK has a knock-on effect on energy and food policy around the world. So the City of London is a major financial centre and UK banks finance fossil fuels and ecological destruction all over the world. So these investments are clearly bad because they cause the climate and ecological destruction, but they also cause risk in the economy. For example, when 
fossil fuel assets become stranded and, and those go bad. And we don't, we want to avoid a situation in which the fossil fuel market crashes in the next decade. And this triggers a banking crisis that some estimates suggest could cost over $5 trillion of public money in bailouts, even more than the 2008 financial crash. So the way that we think about this at Positive Money is that vo voluntary private sector commitments are not nearly enough. And we've seen all sorts of pledges uh, since COP26 from banks promising to do better and disclose their climate risks and publish transition plans. But we know that we need to hold our public institutions account, uh, the Bank of England, the Treasury, the regulators, to be much more active as guardians of economic stability and to make banks actually move the money. Fourth, we need a new approach to inflation. So the average UK household paid £400 more that for food last year, as well as energy bills being extremely high. And the Energy and Climate, and Climate Intelligence Unit calculated that £170 of this, £400 extra, was due to the impacts of climate change and £235 due to oil and gas price rises. We think that this is going to become not the exception, but the norm. So we're going to see more and more price shocks and price instability as climate change intensifies. And the tools that we have to deal with this are just out of date. So I'm sure lots of you saw today that the Bank of England has raised interest rates again to 4.25%, but interest rates were never meant to tackle inflation caused by supply shocks in energy and food. As the, and the Bank of England governor has admitted himself that raising interest rates won't produce more gas, it won't produce more semiconductor chips, and it won't definitely won't produce more food. So what it but what it will do is transfer costs to ordinary people and businesses by raising the cost of borrowing. So we, we think that we need a much broader approach to inflation that involves the people affected in a in an era of climate instability. And that the agricultural transition, food security policy shoring up supply chains, the renewable energy revolution should all be considered inflation reduction policies. The final point I wanted to make is just about the banking ecosystem as a whole. So in the UK, we have five big lenders that have huge control over the allocation of resources in the economy. And before the pandemic, only two to 5% of bank lending was going to small and medium enterprises. So given that over 90% of UK farms are made up of sole traders or family partnerships, this is obviously a, ma a major issue for the agricultural sector as well, as well as being just a very undemocratic system. So we think that we need, as well as more public banking options and national and local development banks, we also need a more diverse ecosystem of community and stakeholder banks like credit unions that are designed to actually manage resources in particular places uh, more democratically by people in those communities themselves and that that would serve the transition much better. So that's, the, I'm, I'm sure I've missed lots of important things. Those are <laughs> a few that I've picked out of our kind of manifesto at Positive Money on transforming the financial sector. We definitely need more grassroots groups to be holding the Bank of England and government to account on this and they've done an amazing job so far we've seen incredible resistance um, in the City of London and at the Bank of England itself and we need much more of this to see the transformation in the money and banking system that we def that we that we do desperately need so I think I'll stop there I actually wasn't timing myself but I may have been under time which never happens um, but yeah very happy to take questions and to be contacted by email or Twitter if anything comes up um, or to answer questions about our work. I'll leave it there. Thanks, John.